in at the back still, but um, I'm, I'm going to uh, kick us off and say a very warm welcome to everybody to the um, 2021 Sue Lloyd Roberts Memorial Lecture. Um, this is uh, usually an annual event in memory of our uh, very dear alumna, Sue Lloyd Roberts, and it's one of the highlights in our annual program. Um, and, but this year, of course, uh, it, it's, it's coming back after a, after a gap. My name is uh, Georgina Paul. I'm the acting principal of St Hilda's College at the moment um, in the interregnum between the retirement of our principal, uh, Gordon Duff, who retired at the end of July, and the arrival of our new principal, um, Professor Sarah Springman, on the 1st of February next year. And after the aforementioned year's pause on account of the pandemic, it's a very great pleasure to welcome you all back and to see Sue's uh, family, friends, and former colleagues here with us to resume the lecture series in person. Uh, and we are recording, so it will be available online too. Welcome to those watching online. As Sue's College, we are honoured to host this event and are deeply grateful to all who have contributed to the fund we set up in Sue's memory. This fund now provides awards to current St Hilda students to assist them to undertake vacation placements, projects or unpaid internships in the media industry. And we do hope that some of our students will follow in Sue's courageous footsteps in the future. I'm going now, though, to call on Sue's husband, Mr Nick Guthrie, the producer of BBC Dateline, who will introduce our distinguished speaker this evening. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming, braving <coughs> storms and traffic and everything else. Thank you very much for being here tonight. This is the fifth year of these memorial lectures in memory of Sue. We live in a wonderful world, yet man's inhumanity to man soldiers on. Child slavery, honor killings, forced marriages, the death penalty, all excused by cultural differences and all things that Sue campaigned against. And yet, she knew she lived in a wonderful world. She also exposed authoritarian regimes and was given a heavy jail sentence by the Chinese for exposing their labor camps and their killing of prisoners for their organs to be sold on world markets. Yeah, it's a wonderful world. But wait, hear this from my cousin, Field Marshal Lord Charles Guthrie, who handed Hong Kong back to China in July 1997. In his recent memories, he writes, we have failed to see that there, the Chinese, inherent lack of scruples, their preening, their ambition, would result in the threat that they have now become. Their ruthless policy, of co-option, coercion, concealment, and mendacity poses the single, the single greatest threat to world peace today. Well, perhaps not such a wonderful world. Tonight we have another tireless campaigner as our speaker and a world expert on China. And yes, we all really do need to understand what is happening in China what its ambitions are, and how we should deal with them before they deal with us. Take their stand at COP26. It's up to the West to sort out the climate crisis, they said. Well, unless they come up on side, sea level will say goodnight to Shanghai, alongside Miami, Alexandra, and Inundelt 
inundate every deltatic region on the planet from 2100 onwards. Perhaps not such a wonderful world. Anyway, enough from me tonight. We're fortunate enough to have someone who really does know what is going on. Please welcome a dear friend and a very courageous lady, a truly wonderful person, Isabel Hilton. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, um, acting principal. And thank you all of you for braving this freezing night. It's very good to see you. It's very good to be here. And of course, it's a great, um, it's a great honor to be asked to give this lecture in memory of a friend and a colleague for whom, like many others, I had a huge respect and affection. I can't just say it's, it, you can describe it as a pleasure to give a memorial lecture because quite honestly, um, like most of the people here, I'm sure, I would prefer that there was no occasion for it. Um, and that Sue was still with us and plying her trade as, as brilliantly as ever. Um, so it is a moment infused with some sadness, but it's also a moment to reflect on her many strengths, on her talents, and to try to imagine how she might be applying them in this very changed world. Many others have paid tribute to Sue's singular mix of courage, determination, and moral compass. She had many passions, and she pursued them with a characteristic courage, a lot of good humor, and a serious helping of that low cunning that Nick Tomlin, uh, another outstanding journalist, often recommended as, as an essential quality in journalism. After all, uh, we spend a lot of time trying to discover things uh, that some people don't want us to know, and Sue never did hesitate to use the arts of deception in pursuit of her goal. These episodes are well documented, and I don't need to rehearse them here, but it does raise the question, in an era in which misinformation and fact-free uh, accusations are thrown around as to when subterfuge is legitimate in pursuit of a higher goal. It shouldn't be undertaken, of course, without reflection. And Sue's goals did include the defense of the vulnerable, of women, of victims, of political violence, of ordinary people uprooted by war, by civil disorder, or natural catastrophe. And throughout her career, she held to the belief that there is a moral obligation to shine a light on human suffering and its causes. Frequently, those causes are other human beings, of course, in the hope that by doing so, we might contribute to the alleviation or the end of that suffering. And today, I find myself wondering what she would have made of a world that has changed so much, even since her untimely death six years ago, and wishing that we could still have a conversation about it. And I'm sure she'd have something illuminating to say about our changed landscape. Just as a preliminary list of the things that have changed, we could mention the fragmentation of the post-war order, the systemic challenge to global norms of international law and human rights, the weakening and perhaps the decline of liberal democracy beginning in the United States, where it remains in an extremely fragile state and its future health is far from guaranteed, the acceleration in frequency and severity of climate change impacts, Floods, fires, pestilence, sometimes the horsemen of the apocalypse do seem rather close. And of course, the rise of China, which is one of the contributory factors to at least some of the above, though not, as it sometimes portrayed, the source of all the world's evils. And at the same time, it's an essential element in any resolution of the most pressing crisis, that of climate change. So at least two items on that list, climate change and the rise of China, were well underway six years ago. But the pace has quickened, and the political as well as the physical temperatures have risen to the point that the impacts of both are contributing to a very, very different landscape from the one that I've known most of my working life. <clears throat> Sue was deeply involved, of course, with the defense of human rights through her work, and her starting point was the very clear ground of the Universal Declaration, that milestone document. Drafted, it's worth remembering, by people from very widely different nationalities, legal traditions, and cultures, and proclaimed by the General Assembly in Paris on the 10th of December, 1948. Sue's work exposed violations, often egregious violations, of the human rights norms and rules laid out in the Universal Declaration, 
drawn up in the aftermath of the catastrophe of the Second World War. And that moment when the drafters looked as they wrote for the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief, freedom from fear and want. Article 16, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference, to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Equal rights for men and women, freedom of movement, the presumption of innocence, the right to asylum, the right to hold property. All of these and many more are in that extraordinary document, a document that was not imposed by one nation on another, but agreed as a founding set of principles of the United Nations. The memory of catastrophe, of course, was very close at that moment. It seems to have faded, rather, in our own time. And it's difficult today in the cacophony of misinformation, mudslinging, and willful obstruction of facts that characterizes what we perhaps ironically call the information age, to hold on to the conviction that honest journalism of that nature can remain the force for good, that its best practitioners hope it still is. When large forces grind together as they do now, it's more difficult to be heard, and it, it's even more difficult to be heard speaking on behalf of the weak. Now that wouldn't have stopped Sue, but I suspect that she too would have been dismayed at the current efforts by big powers and some moderate powers to redefine the basis of human rights that she spent so much of her career defending, to refocus away from the universality, the idea that every human being, no matter who, no matter where, has the same rights, and towards the interests of states, those states that are often the very governments that abuse them. It's not new that we must argue about how to deliver on the promise of universal rights. The principles have frequently been abused and every government needs to be held to account, beginning always at home. But what is relatively new is a systematic attempt to downgrade those norms and to rewrite those rules in ways that favor states over individuals, buttressed by an absolute definition of national sovereignty. And yes, China is part of that. China invokes national sovereignty, sovereignty to, re, to refuse scrutiny, to refuse accountability. And yes, its diplomats do work to reduce support for universal rules in all multilateral fora. China's defense is that Western nations tend to favor the civil and political rights, whereas China stresses the material ones. And both are equally important. But if we want to protect a system from attack, we must also ensure that we are beyond reproach. And this, frankly, is not an encouraging time if you're looking for improvements in the humanitarian order. And the fact that we're in the course of an important shift in power relations is forcing us all to rethink some past assumptions. Which brings me back to the China challenge. China, of course, is centrally involved in all the major shifts on my list. And for the past six years, Governments and institutions have slowly and then with increasing urgency tried to understand and adjust to the implications of the rise of China and the profound shift in the global balance that we're living through. And I'm reminded more often than is comfortable of that famous remark of Anthony Gramsci's that the old order is dying and the new struggles to be born. So we're in this uncomfortable interim, a transition with an unclear outcome how long is the passage? What's the end point? The moment when a new order takes shape, that's all far from clear, and I don't claim to have any better sense of what it might be than anyone else, but I certainly feel the ground beneath our feet is shifting, so this is a moment to reflect on what we do believe in and how far we're willing or able to defend it. The symptoms include the symptoms of the sickness of our order, the 2008 financial crisis, the emergence of statist economies, especially the BRICS as a counter model, the rise of the ultra-nationalist right-wing movements across Europe and the United States, the terrible year 2016 when the Brexit vote and Donald Trump's election, and now a pandemic, the effects of which have yet to play out. And indeed the prospect that in the United States, the pillar of the liberal international order like the final reel of the horror movie, Trump could rise again. I think we understand by now that with each new event, it becomes harder to imagine 
a return to some pre-crisis status quo. The pillars of the international liberal order, be it global gov governance norms, or economic openness, or security, they're all being challenged from outside, as they always were, but also from within, more strongly than at any time I can remember. And if Sue were here today, she might find as much to investigate at home as she did always abroad. So if not a return to the world we once knew, what might come next? And how should we view this great challenge of the rise of China? When I first went to China, it was as a student in 1973, and there were 12 British students in China and a similar handful of Chinese students in Britain. China's GDP that year totaled 179 billion US, according to the World Bank. The US GDP, with less than one-fifth of, of, of China's population, was 10 times the size. China's trade was negligible. Poverty was widespread. And years of mass starvation that had killed tens of millions of people was just a decade in the past. Every Chinese student that I met at that time would have had memories of hunger and what it had done. I was meant to be studying literature, but it was a pretty mistimed venture since it was the Cultural Revolution and most literature was firmly off the menu. We were obliged to study model opera, the revolutionary update of traditional Beijing opera that was pioneered by Mao's last wife, Jiang Qing. We also had to study and genuflect to Jiang Qing's literary theory. Now, within a few years, Jiang Qing and her supporters, collectively, the Gang of Four, were arrested and China was on a different path. I doubt that anyone today spends much time on her literary theory, but it was a lesson in learning to mistrust the proposition that political truths are absolute and unchanging, and that whatever you choose to believe, you should keep absolute certainty at bay. A respect for doubt is a very useful thing in journalism, as well as in life. Last year, the United Kingdom welcomed 100,000 Chinese students to Britain. The transformation of China from the era of the Gang of Four to now has been an extraordinary thing to witness. The sheer energy released when Deng Xiaoping opened the country up to the world and the eagerness with which people embraced entrepreneurship at every level has to make you wonder why millenary and communism was ever thought a good fit for a people who seemed to have business in their blood. The world embraced Deng Xiaoping's China in multiple ways, as a partner, as a destination for investment, as the world's factory in China joined the WTO and grew and prospered and delivered low-cost goods to Western consumer markets. Today, it's the world's largest trading nation and the second largest economy. The biggest investor in Africa, in Latin America, the largest trade partner of most of the nations in the UN General Assembly. China's money, China's industrial power, China's ambitions, China's mores, they're reshaping our world. And there's much to celebrate about the emergence from poverty of one-fifth of humanity. So why do we now seem to be in a new confrontation, perhaps on the edge of a new conflict or a new Cold War? How do we deal with the conundrum that our fates are now so intertwined that, that it would almost be equally difficult for us and our economic security if China should fail and if China should succeed? China's provided many of the benefits of globalization that we've enjoyed in the last 30 years. It's also a disruptive power with its own views of the world order. And how we emerge from this uncomfortable interim will depend both on what happens in China and in how we choose to respond to it. China's been there for a long time, as its leaders never tire of reminding us. The ancestral Chinese state dates from 200 BC, though that one only outlasted its founder, Qin Shi Huangdi, by just a few years. And for much of its history, of course, it did hold a commanding position as the biggest country by every measure in its known world. So yes, China's position as a global power is a return to a historical role from which it was displaced 150 years ago. Imperial China situated itself at the center of its world, surrounded by lesser powers from which it demanded respect and tribute and to which, it, in turn, it extended the benefits of the benign gaze of the empire. It didn't always work like that. Uh, China itself spent several centuries as a conquered power, first as part of the Mongol Empire 
and for uh, many years later in a similar role after being conquered by the Manchu, another northern steppe people. And the borders and territories that China now claims are not those of a historic Han China, but of the Manchurian Empire. Today, China's official story is that it is an unchanging, immutable, civilizational state with all the privileges that exceptionalism conveys. It's a curious story when you think about it for a revolutionary party to tell. It's certainly not the one that Chairman Mao told. My early years in China were marked by a firm rejection of China's imperial history and an insistence that a new revolutionary China was headed imminently for the end state of communism. Who was it who first made that old Soviet joke that under communism, the future is certain, it's just the past that's unpredictable. <laughs> but today, those two elements, China's long history and its claim to immutability, coupled with the often repeated story of humiliation by Western powers, these are the foundations of the nationalism that's the core story that China tells today. It's the only country I know of, perhaps you know of others, that has a day in the calendar annually called the Day of National Humiliation a day on which citizens are invited to remember how China suffered at the hands of Western imperialism and critically how the party has made China great again and how the party is now exporting China's superior system and values to the world. I think Sue would have agreed that no big powers have entirely clean hands. I spent much of my career, as she did, reporting on the abuses and atrocities committed in the shadow of US influence. Those whom the US protected and enabled, as well as direct state actors, still have a lot to answer for. But if the US often failed to live up to the values it proclaimed, I would contend, and I think Sue would have agreed, that that was not the fault of the values, and certainly not a reason to demolish the structure that aims to uphold them. The Cold War dominated much of her working life as mine a systemic confrontation between Soviet communism and liberal democracy. Today we have a deepening confrontation between Chinese communism and liberal democracy. And the idea of confrontation sounds similar, but almost everything else is different. Our economic relations with the Soviet bloc were negligible. We had no supply chain dependency, no intertwined investment, no massive mutual exchange of students, no joint ventures, no contracts for the of the production of consumer goods, no medical or scientific partnerships that I know of. We had a wall in a city in Germany. We had an iron curtain, which was indeed a physical fence in many places, dividing Europe, dividing some countries, dividing people and families. Two separate systems that threatened each other with mutually assured destruction, but actually clashed mainly by proxy and in third countries. With China, by contrast, we're like a couple that has definitely fallen out of love and no longer lives together peacefully, but who find their interests so closely entangled that they struggle to imagine living apart. How come we were ever in love in the first place? It's fashionable now, as attitudes harden towards China, to deride as naive the idea that China's middle classes grew more prosperous, that as they grew more prosperous, they would wish for a more inclusive, a more open system of government one that gave its citizens rights and the defense of a legal system and shared opportunity. Today, people ask, how could we have been so stupid as to imagine that the party would ever have allowed that? Well, I beg to differ, actually. I don't remember many people arguing that China would become a liberal democracy overnight. But for more than 100 years, Chinese people have clearly and repeatedly asked for political freedoms and the debate and discussion about political freedoms has also, along with savage power struggles, been a central argument within the ruling party. When I first lived in China, the party controlled every aspect of life. Where you worked, who you were allowed to marry, when you were allowed to marry, how many children you could have, what you earned, where you lived. Not only could you not move an inch without permission, but you were obliged to re repeatedly say how much you loved the leader and the party. And in the end, the party retreated. It began to allow citizens to organize themselves in an emerging civil society that dealt with matters the government couldn't or wouldn't address and created a political system in which it was safe to leave power or to argue about policy and in which losing the political game didn't take you to jail 
or to the execution ground. Did people in the party want that? Of course they did. Now, in many ways, China's going backwards in these respects. But we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that this is necessarily the end state. Here's another quote. It's a slightly longer one. It's from an essay on the catastrophe of the Cultural Revolution, originally written in 1986 and revised in 2012. And it goes, a mechanism which accompanies the separation of powers and mutual checks and balances wouldn't hinder the efficiency of decision making, but rather improve its scientific nature. In short, if such checks and balances can be achieved, it'll be an institutional arrangement that's conducive to the concentration of power to do great things and precluding the concentration of power to do bad things. To quote Mao Zedong, it continues, the idea that there are no factions in the party is nonsense. It wouldn't be a bad thing to let the party diversify internally, to encourage debate and fair competition. Who wrote that? He's called Wang Huning, and he's one of the nine most powerful people in China, a member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. Here's another passage from the same essay. An important part of China's constitution building is to guarantee the citizens' rights to information. It's a very important right. It's important to direct democracy, and it complements the state obligation in terms of transparency and openness. Article 2, brackets 3, of the current constitution provides that the people shall, in accordance with law, manage economic, cultural, and social matters through various channels and means. How can we talk about management if we're not informed? Without knowledge, how can we evaluate the attitude and competence to those who manage us, state officials? Now, Wang Huning wasn't writing this to deceive critical foreigners, but he was writing it as part of a continuing internal discussion of statecraft, of government, of how you run a country of 1.4 billion people. And I quote it because dealing with China is a formidable challenge. But it doesn't help our cause to see China as a cartoon villain. It's one-fifth of humanity, and yes, it can be complicated. But understanding it better, the good and the bad, is part of the challenge. Now, China doesn't really help. It doesn't help those who want to understand it. It has its own cartoon version of itself that it increasingly tries to impose on everybody else, along with its current version of history. It tries to impose it on everyone who thinks or talks or writes about China. And one day, perhaps, China will accept that part of being a great power is having to accept that people will have views and that trying to censor them will tend to reinforce those views. Great powers that endure on the global stage need to win trust more than they need to win fear. Sue did some very, very hard-hitting reports on the bad side of China, including a very early report that Nick mentioned on organ transplant, a horrific story that did, end, that did earn her a jail sentence, though fortunately in absentia. But despite that report and many since, many medical institutions in this country have partnerships in China. Why? Because they're well-funded. And we simply don't fund our universities and our research as we should. China didn't force us to create a marketplace in which China can seek benefit. We did that to ourselves. We entered into all manner of dependencies with China. And when something happens that raises fundamental ethical questions, too often we seem to weigh the cost of our values and principles and fear that the price of defending them is too high. So, yes, let's hold others to account but let's attend to our own house also. This debate is happening in every liberal democracy, in every major corporation that deals with China, in every cultural institution, in higher education, and as we've seen lately, also in sport. And in that debate, there are voices that argue we should just divorce, except that our systems are finally incompatible, that the marriage was a terrible mistake. There's one good reason, though, why that's not a good idea. For good or ill, we share a planet. Two weeks ago, I was in Glasgow at COP26. Anyone who's there or who followed it closely can be in no doubt that we collectively, all 7.9 billion of us, are facing a crisis of our own making, a crisis that threatens all our societies. We are rapidly now making our planet unlivable in truly terrifying ways. And one important difference 
that I noticed when I first started looking and studying climate change 16 years ago. An important difference between the stresses created in societies by the wars and the civil conflicts that I had covered previously is that sooner or later they come to an end. One side wins, or both are exhausted. But the crisis we're creating for ourselves will not be exhausted. With each year that passes, its capacity to undermine us will only grow. All of the challenges that we grapple with now, including mass migration, will be multiplied by climate change. And over the years that I've been involved, I've never heard such urgency and such insistence from the science as was heard in Glasgow. Now, there's plenty of blame to go around in the climate change story, as in everything else, and it is thrown liberally about, much of it, at China. None of us is responding as fast or as consistently as the situation demands. And of course, the blunt truth is the world cannot fix the climate without China. And China cannot fix the climate without the rest of the world. The Chinese are actually very well aware of the dangers that climate poses. How could they not be? The most sophisticated development, think of the Pearl River Delta or Tianjin or Shanghai, all on low-lying deltas. The chronic drought that afflicts the north, or the rapid melting of the snow and ice on the Qinghai-Tibet Plateau, source of all of Asia's great rivers, or the increasingly erratic monsoon, the rains that have determined the rhythm of farming in Asia for centuries. And if none of that makes an impression, think of those images from the city of Zhengzhou earlier this year, when a year's rain fell in a day. And people were trapped in standard subway cars with the water rising. That could happen to London or any other city. A less severe version <coughs> paralyzed the subway in New York when Superstorm Sandy hit. So what is China's role in climate change? Well, as they like to point out, rightly, the historical emissions are on our account, just as others point out that the current and future emissions, the only ones we can affect, are overwhelmingly on China's account. The United States, with one-fifth of the population of China, and a frankly erratic record on global climate policy comes second. Two <coughs> global powers locking horns in a fierce contest for power and influence. And the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking on a climate catastrophe that would engulf them both, our contemporary version of mutually assured destruction. And to avoid that, cooperation is essential. There are echoes, indeed, of the Cold War, two hostile political systems squaring up to each other, equally vulnerable to mutually assured destruction. They had to talk then, the Soviet Union and the United States, despite their differences, to manage the risk of nuclear war. But there is a key difference. Avoiding the danger of nuclear war required both sides to avoid starting one. We've collectively already started changing the climate. Avoiding the catastrophe demands very much more of us against a clock that goes on ticking. And the big moment, the one that science tells us we need to meet or it risks being too late, is just nine years away, 2030. If we overshoot that moment, it all gets much, much harder. So should we deal on, with China? Well, on climate, we have no choice. I sometimes hear people say that China is only willing to talk about climate because it's trading climate for human rights. Again, I beg to differ. I haven't heard that. I certainly have heard China trying to shut down human rights discussions by using the power of the market, by threatening to cut off business. And often it's worked. But I haven't heard it in the climate discussion. What I do worry about is how we keep the dialogue open in an era of mounting nationalism. And what does this imperative to cooperate mean for human rights, for the ethical concerns about gene editing, for example, or forced labor, or organ transplant? Is that the price of cooperation? I don't believe it is. Just as I don't think we should treat China as a cartoon villain, I can't see why the cooperation on an existential threat that is essential to all sides 
should be bought at the price of silence. You can be sure that Chinese critics of the United States will not feel constrained. At the same time, we need to be honest about how much our relationships have drawn us into complicity or silence on those aspects of the regime's behavior that we do object to. The China challenge is partly about China. But as I think I've been explaining, it's also about us. Can we pay for our own universities in ways that don't leave us vulnerable to pressure over interpretations of history? If we complain about China's global influence, where are our contributions to poor countries over the pandemic or over climate? If we can't ensure that our supply chains don't involve forced labor, what are we doing buying the goods? And if we want to argue that liberal democracy remains a better option than authoritarianism, then should we not put our own house in order and make sure that we defend multilateralism and its universal claims? In the end, China's people will determine China's future. But our collective future, including that of China, is also in our hands. Many people said nothing happened in Glasgow at the climate conference, and that's quite wrong. Certainly not enough. We're definitely not there yet. But those who decry the tortuous, complicated debate over the placing of a comma or the substitution of a word, and yes, that goes on. We should also remember that that same process has given us 20 years of science, the science that informs those arguments and the challenges, the challenges to those who seek to confuse and confound about what we're really facing. And just as in 1948, the United Nations came together on human rights, today, it is the only global forum in which we can collectively try to solve this global threat. It is complicated, it's often completely infuriating. But without it, we wouldn't begin to have the tools we need or the place to debate them, including with China. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Isabel. I, I've always, I, I said earlier on um, when 